Well, the third 2020 Democratic Party primary debate is now officially over, and boy was that a long debate. That was honestly difficult to get through, and I have a lot of thoughts about that debate, but most of it is negative. Like, I think I'm going to spend the most amount of time during this video complaining because there were so many issues, both in terms of the debate format and also with the candidates as well. I don't necessarily feel like there really was a breakout winner. I don't think there was a definitive loser, maybe besides Joe Biden, but we'll get into all of that. All I know is that a three hour long debate is very difficult to get through if, you know, we're not really having that much fireworks if we're not focusing long enough on certain subjects and if the candidates are just outright lying about policies. But before we get into the specifics, let's just go to some numbers. First of all, when it comes to Twitter followers and growth throughout the duration of the debate, Andrew Yang gained the most with 7,566 new Twitter followers. Elizabeth Warren came in second with 4,000, Buttigieg in third with 4,000, Beto O'Rourke in fourth with 3,000, Sanders with 2,000, Harris with 2,000, Booker with nearly 2,000, Klobuchar with 1,000, Castro with 1,000, and Joe Biden with nearly 1,000 new Twitter followers. To see how that looks in terms of relative growth, you still see Andrew Yang with the largest gain. Now, in terms of Andrew Yang, even though he had the least amount of talk time, which we'll get to, he was the most searched candidate after the debate, with Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren actually coming in second place, Bernie Sanders not really being searched. To see Joe Biden searched that much, I wouldn't necessarily view that as a positive for Joe Biden. It was mostly due to some of the things that happened throughout the debate that were embarrassing. Now, when it comes to total minutes, of course, Joe Biden predictably came in first with 17.4 minutes, Warren in second with 16.5 minutes, Cory Booker in third with 14.7 minutes, which is actually a little bit unfair, seeing that other candidates who are polling higher than him didn't get as much time to talk. Sanders in fourth with 14.1 minutes, Harris in fifth with 13.7 minutes, Buttigieg with 11.4, Castro with 11, Klobuchar with 10.4, O'Rourke with 9.3, and Yang with 7.9. Now, halfway throughout the debate, it was not looking too good for Bernie Sanders in terms of talk time, because even if he's in second place, he barely got more time to speak than Andrew Yang, which is absolutely absurd. Now, overall, to kind of give you a sense of what this debate felt like to me um i want to go to a tweet from friend of the show matt bender who says this debate is the worst of them all so far we went from the zero percenters in the polls debating with the top tier candidates to just the one to five percenters debating amongst each other while the moderators just leave the top candidates out of the convo completely and i totally agree with that so let's just get to some of the things that stood out to me first of all and the most troubling for me from the standpoint uh, as a bernie sanders supporter is the fact that he sounded like he needed a drink of water and a cough drop you can just tell that he was campaigning too hard his team has got to suspend the campaigning events at least like three days before debates because even though we all know that this is due to him speaking you lose your voice that's just natural the media is not going to be that kind to him they're not going to say oh well you know this is understandable he's talking a lot he lost his voice they're going to be looking for reasons to attack him during these debates this is his time to shine and unfortunately i think that that was a big hindrance when it comes to joe biden Biden. There was a moment in this debate where, I kid you not, it looked as if he had dentures in his mouth that were about to fall out. Because God's done me for. I'm the only one. God's done me for. I'm the only one. Now, I don't know what that was, um, but I mean, clearly, he stumbled to make any point. He was certainly more aggressive this time, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he was more coherent. He still seemed belligerent. Um, he came across as someone who struggled to collect his thoughts. It was just overall another bad performance from Joe Biden. I mean, at this point, it seems cruel to continue this. Like, somebody's got to intervene and say, Biden, look, 
you're just you can't you can't do this you're not stable enough on top of that we had the protesters interrupt the debate for about a minute minute and a half and their chance was completely uh inaudible you couldn't hear a single word that they were saying it seemed like there were multiple people just screaming random things there was no cohesive message from the protesters so i'm not against protesting at the debate but if you're going to protest and chant something you all have to seemingly say the same thing so we can understand what you're saying there was yang's big surprise that he hyped up that turned out to be him giving the freedom dividend to 10 families for a year great idea probably should have done this earlier to demonstrate the utility of it although i do get that you know he probably didn't have the money for it so overall this debate was the worst by far um just compared to the other ones there was really no moment that stood out to me there was no one one winner everyone was just kind of in the middle and it's because you know the moderators they called on the zero to five percenters more than the top tier candidates and we all came to this wanting to see bernie and warren go up against joe biden but that didn't happen because bernie sanders didn't get called on nearly enough elizabeth warren too in fact throughout a really large portion of the debate Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, they just faded into the background and they were not being called on and they should have absolutely elbowed their way in. But the moderators are also, you know, they share part of that responsibility. Think about this. Bernie Sanders, he has been graded as having the strongest climate change plan. And when it came to the discussion about climate change, he wasn't even called on. Now, in terms of winners and losers, before we get to specifics, I do want to list the winners and losers. This is entirely subjective. I honestly, I don't think you can really make a strong case for anyone being an objective winner or maybe an objective loser with the exception of Joe Biden. I think it's obvious that he is a loser here. But I mean, this was all over the place. This was difficult to pin down. It's incredibly subjective. And I think you can kind of argue that any one candidate won this um and be relatively persuasive so let's get to this of course you know biden is a loser because everyone teamed up against him again not to the extent that i had hoped for but nonetheless they still attacked biden he was a target and he made a fool of himself as i stated and you know a lot of the things that he said uh came off as incoherent he referred to bernie sanders as the president at one point and he you know called cory booker future president at the last debate so i mean it's just embarrassment after embarrassment contradiction after contradiction which julian castro actually called out i think magically and then we had amy klobuchar who as soon as she opened her mouth the momentum died i mean the lack of energy was palpable and the one-liners that she clearly rehearsed were unquestionably the most cringeworthy moments of the night where you can actually make the argument that she was the biggest loser so she planned out and you could tell this was planned a line about bernie sanders i wrote the damn bill and she said yeah well while bernie sanders wrote the bill i read the bill and then she kind of paused as if that warranted applause and NBC News made this creepy image of that. And it, I, I like this. This is awful. <laughs> this is just, I don't know what to say about this. Another line throughout the debate that I wrote down that um, I don't even know how to process it. She said, you know, that movie uh, day after tomorrow, it's today. She said that with regards to climate change, that person got the opportunity to talk about climate change Bernie Sanders did not. Amy Klobuchar, a complete failure. This was probably her worst performance because at the previous two debates, she kind of just faded into the background and then she didn't have the chance to really step out into the spotlight and make a fool of herself. But this time, you know, since the focus was on the zero to five percenters, one to five percenters, she did and she failed. Yeah. Now, the way that I judge these debates are I have four different categories. I have the winner category, the good category, the meh category, and the loser category. So in that loser category, I place Biden and Klobuchar, although that's arguable. I'm pretty set on keeping Biden in that loser category since he's slipping in the polls. He really needed to have a good night and he didn't. 
I'm not really willing to waver on that. I'm pretty committed to Klobuchar being in that loser category. Although, when we get to the meh, the good, and even the winner category, I think this is entirely subjective, and I think that you could make the case that maybe my assessment here is wrong. Maybe I'll change my mind after you know, sleeping on it, but this is difficult for me. So in the meh category, I placed two individuals, Kamala Harris and Andrew Yang. Now, the reason why I placed Kamala here is because she absolutely needed to have a good moment. She had momentum after that first debate because I think that her performance was phenomenal, but she lost that momentum after the second debate when, as we all know, Tulsi Gabbard demolished her. And she needed to use this debate to recover. Tulsi's not here. So nobody will probably be as harsh on Kamala as Tulsi was. So this was the opportunity for her to recover. Did she recover? No, I don't think she recovered. I think it was Kyle Kalinske, to his credit on Twitter, made the point that it's clear she's listening more to strategists because she's talking about these personal stories. She's coming off as less authentic, more rehearsed. And it's just bad. You know, I think that this was the one moment where she could have had redemption and she didn't have it. Andrew Yang, I, I'm not committed to keeping him in the meh category. You can move him to good and I'd say, you know what, I agree with you. I think that that's fair. I'm putting him in the meh category because he hyped up his announcement and it fell flat. And then after that, he essentially faded into the background for a large portion of the debate, like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, but he never kind of recovered from that. He was just in the background. And then he had some really weird moments in the debate where he said, come to America, where the water is great. I mean, to say this at a time when there are water crises happening, you know, Flint still doesn't have clean drinking water. Not the best look doesn't necessarily show that you are, you know, aware of what's happening. Also, he had a question about charter schools. I actually did not know that Andrew Yang supported charter schools. And when he was asked to kind of defend this, he had a poor defense. So overall, not a great performance. I will say that Yang did better in the sense that he diversified his platform seemingly, where, you know, he didn't take every question and tie it to UBI, which I think is important. But at the same time, Yang, I don't, I don't fault him entirely for having a relatively, arguably poor debate performance because he was just ignored. I mean, think about this. He is polling higher than Julian Castro, Amy Klobuchar, Cory Booker, and in some polls, Pete Buttigieg, and he got less time to talk than all of them, not necessarily because he wasn't speaking up enough, but because the moderators had no interest in hearing from Andrew Yang. So in part, that's why I don't necessarily want to place him in that meh category because, you know, maybe he would have performed better, but I will also say that his energy seemed lacking when you compare, you know, this to his performance at that second debate. I think he did a phenomenal job. He shined, but here I just feel like, you know, his energy level, it was down more. And when you couple that with the moderators clearly not really caring about him, um, it just, it wasn't great for Andrew Yang. It wasn't great, but you know, I don't necessarily think he has to worry because he's rising in the polls gradually. So he's moved himself from someone who's like a one percenter into the mid tier and that's great for him. So, you know, this wasn't make or break from, for Andrew Yang, you know, but you know, his performance, it did leave a lot to be desired. Now here's where we get to the tricky part, the good category. This is entirely arguable. Um, in this category, I place Beto O'Rourke, Pete Buttigieg, Bernie Sanders, and Elizabeth Warren. Now, the one person who I really think you can kind of argue against being in this category is Pete Buttigieg. You can move him to the meh category and say, Mike, you're wrong. He shouldn't be in the good category. Move him to, you know, the, the meh category, downgrade him. And I'd say I think that you're probably fair to say that because... He did have some really embarrassing, almost cringeworthy moments. So when there was this debate about healthcare, he tried to step in and talk about, oh, well, you see, you know, I'm above the fray and, you know, this is why people hate politics. This is a primary. This is a debate. Stop. That's embarrassing. It comes off as disingenuous. And really, Pete Buttigieg, to me, is disingenuous, although I will say he pulls off what I think Joe Biden and Amy Klobuchar want to pull off, albeit more successfully. He comes across as the centrist and more, you know, reasonable, moderate candidate. 
better than they do, but he's trying to present himself as a progressive. The problem is every time he opens his mouth, you just see the energy die, and nothing he really says is revolutionary, and I think that his time has kind of passed. He had his moment where he was on the spotlight and he was the media darling. I think his time is going to pass. I think that that new spotlight will be dedicated to someone like Julian Castro, possibly. Warren is kind of the media darling currently, but we'll see. Okay, the next person, Beto O'Rourke. You know, watching the first third of this debate, I was expecting to place him in the winner category, which is a little bit weird because Beto O'Rourke's performance in these debates has been abysmal, but he actually did a relatively good job. He was strong. He said, yes, we're going to take your AR-15s. He's just opening himself up to attacks from Republicans, but you know what? Kudos to him for being bold. You know, this gun buyback program, if you're going to have it, it can be optional for, you know, weapons that aren't meant to kill fucking dinosaurs. But when it comes to AR-15s, I absolutely think that that gun buyback should be mandatory because you are not allowed to own tanks. We're not allowed to own nukes. We shouldn't be allowed as citizens to own weapons that can kill lots of people that are designed to kill lots of people. So kudos to him. He also got credit from uh, Biden and Kamala Harris for um, his response to El Paso. And he came off as slightly less rehearsed this time. But again, you can place him in the mad category because he faded into the background for the rest of the debate. So again, this is all entirely subjective. When it comes to Bernie and Warren, I placed them in the good category. Um, and... For a moment, I thought, should I put them in the meh category? But I'm not going to do that because even if they weren't called on that much, they did get more talk time towards the end of the debate. And every time they opened their mouths, they made phenomenal, stellar points. Like Bernie Sanders, he he has this tendency to really shift the direction of the conversation in a really positive, more substantive way, where he talks about the issue in a more systemic way, he touches on the broad causal mechanisms that lead to these problems in the first place, and he does this in such a brilliant way that even if he had his raspy voice, you know, you can't help but think, man, what a solid point, this is so refreshing. And there were moments where he did hit Biden relatively hard. He kind of took an indirect shot at Warren by saying, I'm the only person on this stage who voted against all three of Donald Trump's military bills so he had his great moments this certainly was probably his poorest performance out of all three debates thus far but saying that he still did a good job um even if he just didn't have the time to talk elizabeth warren as well she did a good job she hasn't really performed poorly in any of these debates thus far but i think that like bernie this was probably her weakest performance you know in comparison with the other debates so let's get on to the winners category. And here I have two individuals. One of them is absolutely arguable, Cory Booker. I put Cory Booker in the winner category basically for one reason. He had the uh, second or third most talk time. I'm, I'm already forgetting the statistic. And um, he's polling at like, what is it, two, three percent? He's polling lower than Andrew Yang, but he still managed to get a lot of talk time. And the way that the moderators responded to him, the way they kept calling on him repeatedly, it really gave Americans the sense, I think, possibly, that he was a leader. You know, he spoke confidently about a lot of things. Um, I don't know. This is arguable, though. I'm not really committed to keeping him in the winner category. There's one person who I absolutely feel like they really gained the most and they were at the lowest position, so they needed to have a good performance, and they did. That person, and who I think overall is the biggest winner, probably, is Julian Castro. Now, Julian Castro, he almost didn't make it into this debate, and you could very well make the case that he should not have been in this debate. It should have been Tulsi Gabbard, or even possibly Marianne Williamson, because, you know, there's not as much grassroots support behind him as there are for these other candidates. With that being said, though, he targeted Joe Biden, and that absolutely helped him out tremendously. You know, there were no really gigantic moments where there was fireworks, but if I had to say there was one, it probably was, you know, the numerous exchanges between Julian Castro and Joe Biden. And polling so low, you have to use these debates to propel your name because you may not qualify for that next debate in October. 
And I think he did enough to where he could get a boost in the polls. Um, this could have been his breakout performance, his breakout moment. Will that translate in the polls? I don't know. I mean, when you look at the Google trends, he wasn't the most Googled candidate. Andrew Yang was, even though, you know, Julian Castro didn't have or doesn't have still very much name recognition. Usually, the candidates who get those boosts in terms of followers and Google searches are the ones who have the most to gain, who have the least amounts of name recognition. You know, the Tulsi Gabbards, the uh, Marianne Williamsons, the Andrew Yangs of the world. So you would, would have expected if this debate was solid enough for Julian Castro, him to kind of be included there, but he didn't have much new Twitter followers. He wasn't really searched. So there's just not a lot of momentum for him. And I think that part of the reason why that is the case is because he does come off as the typical rehearsed politician. And he's against Medicare for all. He's not very progressive, but towards the beginning of the debate, in his opening statement, he tried to present himself as someone who's progressive. And um, he's not. He's not very progressive. His record in Obama's administration is actually not great. It's, it's poor, you could argue. So that's basically my take. Again, this is entirely subjective, and I think that if you challenge me on some of these, I would think that that's fair, because I'm kind of wavering on some of these, and my opinion could change, you know, uh, tomorrow, the next day, a week from now, because this debate was all over the place. Basically, everyone had, you know, a performance that kind of blended together in my head. There was no breakout star, there was no you know, main moment where you could point to and say, that was awesome. Um, there was none of that. There was no excitement for this debate. And the one moment that really got me worked up was at the beginning when they started this debate about healthcare. And it's infuriating because we always see this and it's not changing. We always see a debate between the corporate financed candidates where they essentially repeat the same talking points from the health insurance industry and then the progressives are forced to respond to them. But these are lies. They are lying to you. And it's infuriating that we have to rehash this same debate every single time. But I mean, that's unfortunately what's going to happen. You had Joe Biden forget Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren's names. He also forgot, uh, I'm assuming, Pete Buttigieg's name at one point. Uh, Bernie Sanders said that, you know, even if Joe Biden is arguing that the cost of Medicare for all will be 32 trillion, the status quo will actually be higher. He, you know, called out the advertising of the health insurance industry. Uh, Elizabeth Warren made the solid point that nobody really likes their health insurance. They like their doctors. And when Bernie Sanders talked about how, you know, we pay more per capita than other countries for worse results, Biden said, well, this is America. And then Bernie chimed in and shot that down. It was just a really bad line from Biden. So overall, when it comes to healthcare, I do still think that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, they did have the edge. Although I will say this, when it comes to Elizabeth Warren, she finally released her healthcare proposal on her website. And it seems to differ from Bernie in some areas. For example, when it comes to mental health care. It seems as if she's allowing a role for private health insurance with regard to mental health. So I don't know. We need her plan to be scored by advocates and activists of Medicare for All. But, you know, for purposes of this debate, the strategy of her and Bernie Sanders teaming up, it is important, I think, because they have to take down Biden. Until they take down Biden, I just don't think that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren have any real reason to direct their fire against each other because he is still the biggest threat. But that's really the one specific issue that I wanted to touch on. Moving on to, you know, just some random moments for the night. Kamala didn't have you know, the worst night ever. I wouldn't say that she's a loser like she was after that second debate, but she had a moment where she said, look, Joe Biden, instead of saying, no, we can't, maybe say, yes, we can, something to that effect. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I thought that was a good line. Um, we had Elizabeth Warren talk about corruption. Bernie Sanders then expanded that conversation um, because Elizabeth Warren talked about, you know, the reason why there's inaction with regard to gun reform is because of corruption. Bernie then brought in that conversation out. I will say... I don't agree with Bernie Sanders and his stance on the filibuster, and I don't know why he's being so stubborn here, but this is something that I certainly want to try to move him on, because I don't I don't like his stance. I don't like that he's not willing to get rid of, you know, the filibuster. Now, thankfully, he has been open about using budget reconciliation to pass policies like Medicare for All, but just get rid of it. I mean, Republicans, 
they don't play by the same rules. So why would you impose, you know, this arbitrary rule on yourself? It's kind of like asymmetric warfare and you are choosing to give yourself an additional disadvantage when, you know, all bets are off. Republicans are going to play dirty, so you should play dirty too. So that's the one thing that I disagree with Bernie about. Going through my notes here, the question that Jorge Ramos posed to Bernie about socialism was embarrassing because, first of all, Bernie Sanders, I don't believe he's a true socialist. He describes himself as a democratic socialist, but in actuality, he is a social democrat. He believes in a mixed economy, capitalism plus socialism, public and private. That's what Bernie Sanders is. Jorge Ramos is smart enough to know that. So to say that what he's proposing is to make us similar to Venezuela or to force Bernie to differentiate himself and his ideology from Venezuela and Cuba is embarrassing for Jorge Ramos. Like you expect better from Jorge, but that was a terrible question. Do better, Jorge. Additionally, during the climate change discussion, Beto O'Rourke said something that really stood out to me. He said that we need to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Now, let me remind you, last year, the IPCC said we have 12 years to act. It's almost been a year, so we have 11 years to act. He is saying that 2050 is when we get to net zero. I've got really, really bad news for you, buddy. That is not going to suffice. So that was embarrassing. But overall, I just want us to all step back and ask ourselves this question, because this is a question that I think will be important in gauging who, who was successful throughout the course of this debate. Did the needle move substantially at all for anyone or, you know, just in general for this Democratic primary process? And I would argue for the most part, no. If we're going to see any change, the only thing I would suspect is that Julian Castro maybe gets a boost, but again, I'm not entirely certain that that will in fact be the case, because even though I think he had the biggest breakout moment of the night and the strongest performance overall, I don't think it was as big as Kamala's performance in that first debate when she went after Joe Biden, so I don't necessarily know that his good performance will translate into better polling. Now, in terms of what will continue to happen throughout the course of this primary process, I believe that Joe Biden will continue to go down. Uh, Elizabeth Warren will probably continue to rise. I think that her and Bernie did enough to maintain. I don't think that this debate did enough to really move any one candidate off course or onto a better trajectory, with the exception of Julian Castro. But if I had to guess, probably not too much. So what I'm trying to say is this debate... Uh, effectively was useless. It just wasn't great. I had problems with the format. They didn't touch on a number of really important issues. They didn't touch on women's rights. Uh, they didn't touch on LGBTQ rights. They didn't spend nearly enough time on climate change. Foreign policy was really a quick, superficial discussion about Afghanistan, but nobody really had the opportunity to lay out a more broad vision when it comes to foreign policy, nobody was asked about whether or not they're against U.S. imperialism. Overall, I just I don't feel like this debate was very substantive, and I don't really think it was substantial enough to move the needle in any way. Um, and again, Julian Castro maybe being the one exception. So I really hope that the next debate is better, more exciting. That's my take on the debate. This was all over the place. It's very difficult to pin down a really, you know, a concrete winner and a loser, but I'm going to say Castro, winner overall, Biden, loser overall, but I'm, I'm curious to know what you guys think.